Thank you, thank you. Because you are... Since, since Pastor John is coming in a little bit late, I think that we need to, as soon as he walks in, I think we need to celebrate him. What do you think? <laughs> and we, just, we all stand up. And so even if it is in the middle of my sermon, the anointing is there. Don't be afraid. The dove will come back again. So <laughs> we, we, we're going to chase out the pigeons and then bring the dove back. I, I was actually, it was kind of a fun because we were doing this event in Denver or in actually Castle Rock, Colorado. And I was just brought a smile to my face because maybe some of you know who Dan Moeller is. Yeah, so he's a very dear friend and has been a friend for, because he kind of, a, for some of you don't know, but he was the one that mentor Todd White. So if you see Todd White, you know he's been around Dan Moeller. So it's that kind of story. And, and, and the pastor of both of the guys is a very close covenant friend. His name is Don Wallabies in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. It's like a little town of 2,000 people. That's where those guys, that's where Dan lives and is when he's not traveling, he's preaching. But anyway, the story is that he was at our event, and I had just done the three cheers, and about the rooted and grounded in love. Uh, I had just done the three cheers about being rooted and grounded in love. And, and as I was doing that, so the whole group was just, we had just gone. So Dan came in for the next session. He had not been around. So he flew in, and he's going to do the session. So he just came in, and he's just started to... And he quotes scriptures because, as you know, Dan, he just loved quoting scriptures. He went right to Ephesians and he talked about, yeah, according to the word of God, you are rooted in God. And the whole group is like, hey. And he was just, he just froze like he didn't know what was happening because everybody's like, hey. And he's like, what just happened? Here? So it's almost like, what an excitement these people have for the word of God. And it's like, and I didn't tell Dan before afterwards that he was like in shock what happened. And, but then I thought also I was at Planet Shakers a couple of weeks and a couple of months ago. And there's another beautiful family in Australia. And actually, it's throughout the world. But we were together. And that touched my heart on a deep level. When you tell a Planet Shaker, I'm going to open up to John chapter 4, the whole place shouts out. And it is this excitement for the word of God. And they just did something deep in me. I almost wanted to spread that culture around. That when we just even when we mentioned the word of God, they had trained their people to honor the word of God with such an excitement, and they had a big shout. So, I mean, so I'm like, I'm going to quote scriptures all day long here. Was like, I got such a celebration. So I was like, wow, let me, I'm going to give you 31 extra scripture verses today just because I get that, hey, every time the word of God was quoted. I thought about this morning just to start by showing a little picture of my family because, uh, and this is before my two grandkids. This is almost two years ago. You can never say, oh. Uh, so it is Rayvon over here, and then it's my daughter Lila, myself, my wife Jennifer. We've been married for 35 years. Yeah, it's a wonderful. And it was my daughter Courtney when she was getting married in Norway to her husband Virgar. Uh, and they live in Norway. And then it is Catherine, who is my youngest. She's my baby, and she is single, guys. I just want you to know. I don't live by faith always. I live by hints sometimes. <laughs> and then this is my son, Leif Emanuel. And it is also my daughter-in-law. And this is Emily. So I just want you to meet my family and also remember to pray for them because you maybe sometimes hear my stories. Uh, and often I've said that the ones that are the true heroes in this story is my family. And it's been my children over the years when they've been home. And I still remember it was one incident that uh, I, I was in a hotel. This is back before the you couldn't get cell phone service in the Middle East. There were cell phones, but because uh, they didn't let us have service. I had an old Motorola satellite phone. So if I was an emergency, I took this big antenna out and pulled it out, finding a spot where there's kind of an a open heaven, be able to make an emergency call. And it was one of those moments where they had stirred up in the mosque that I had blasphemed the Prophet Muhammad. 500 people showed up with knives and guns, and they were coming to kill me. And I was escaping, so I was, I was heading into this meeting, and was met with his mob who were trying to leave, ended up at the Abari Hotel in the courtyard, and I'm trying to escape the country. So it was one of those very tense moments. I'm trying to call my wife with this, this Motorola <laughs> satellite phone, and she didn't answer. I found out later on she's out cutting the grass. And so, but I was able to get my assistant at the time, who was actually Frida Taylor, who was married to Jack Taylor. So I, I told Frida, Frida, just tell my wife that there's about 500 guys, they're coming to kill me right now. And so, but I, I should be okay. So just tell her that. It, 
So I'll just give you that as wisdom. If 500 guys comes to kill you, that is not a wise thing to do. And I think, I think it was almost 40 hours before I landed safely in the United Arab Emirates. And when I landed there safely, was able to call my wife and she's like, hey, why did you call me? But, and so it was one of those moments. So I'm learning a lot of wisdom over the years, but I wanted just to share both of you to see their faces and pray for them. And now we have two grandchildren. I want to take a few moments also to share. We do also, uh, there's a couple of things I mentioned when I had my baptism of love. And in December of 1999, also we started Global Mission Awareness. And pretty much we are just a family. We used to be a family on mission. I mentioned covenant and kingdom, family and the mission. It's not family or mission. It is not family and mission. It is family on mission. It is the alignment for the assignment. Yeah. Uh, so I'm putting this just into perspective. Even I have the chairs behind me. I'm not going to go up and do that now. But uh, so I'm heading into the message. But I wanted just to share a little of that journey. So I started this process with Papa Jack and learning to be a son. First of all, to Papa God, because I've been from an orphan to learning to be a son. But then God gave me a spiritual father who passed away three years ago. For 22 years, we got to do life together. And it was phenomenal. What I needed to do was, uh, over a six-year period of time, I mean, I tried to be a good son, but I just didn't know how to be a very good son. I was just, I was pretty much was needy to some degree. I, I learned to be a son of blessing, but I didn't know how to be a son of inheritance. Meaning that, and my kids, when they were younger, they were sons and daughters of blessings. That meaning they are in the home and getting all the benefits of the home. But later on, as I said, they need to move into the maturity. And the value system is no longer just what you're going to do for them. You're moving into a friendship level. So it was six years into this journey with Papa Jack. And suddenly God was dealing with my heart. And I had a crash landing. It was part of also me experiencing loving me the way he loves me. Because I was burned out. I crash landed. And through that crash landing, I came out of a treatment center because I had because of all my surgery I had spent 11 years on opiates uh, nine years I was using it but for two years I went down the spiral because I was constantly going into the darkest places but I did not able to stop because there was always another need another crisis and I never stopped uh, up enough so what you did is you started to medicate because the doctor says you cannot travel but again, I felt I needed to because of all the needs in the world and nobody else can go. And, but it was just one of those things that, so the story was in, it was in 2005, December 2nd, I ended up in a treatment center. I came out of that in the treatment center in the next five months. And it was a very painful time because during this time, I, I went cold turkey. They wanted to put me on some different things like a, you either put on a methadone or suboxone or something else as you're going through this transition, especially if you have had 11 years on a lot of medication. So this is just me sharing a little bit of the other side of the story. So in the treatment center, I felt, no, I'm supposed to do a cold turkey which is not a very easy thing to do. So the first 12 days, you're afraid you're going to die. The next 18 days, you're afraid you're not going to die. <laughs> if you've been there, you understand. It just got worse. It was just, I'm looking back at it now, you can smile, but it was one of those darkness. But the biggest pain for me was the presence lifted. But the deception of it week before I ended up in a treatment center was the greatest anointing in my life, both for healings and miracles. So there was this thing, and so this was part of the reason I could get going, because it was always God was showing up in this powerful way, including the week before I just left Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I was standing up like this in the front of you, and this Muslim was sitting behind. He just came up behind me in the meeting. But just being in my shadow while I was preaching him there, the crippled limbs in the front of the people. And when I walked through the airport in Dar es Salaam, the presence of God hit people. I was afraid I was going to be arrested because people ended up on the floor without praying. But I was dysfunctional. And then I'm coming home to Huntsville Airport, arriving in Florence, Alabama. And then my father-in-law, excuse me, not excuse me, my spiritual father, my pastor, my wife, they did an intervention. And they saved me from myself. Because I could never stop because it was always a crisis, another need, and I didn't know how to love myself. I knew how much the Father loved me and how much he loved the world. I just didn't know how to love me. The story is I came out of that, and the next four months was tough because I couldn't see his face. I couldn't hear his voice. I couldn't feel his love. There was no present. And I want you to know, theologically speaking, because I came from a Baptist background, I was not afraid that the Spirit was not in me, but it was not upon me. 
The spirit in you is for yourself. The spirit upon you is for the people around you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you so that you can be a witness. So in John 20, the disciples received the Holy Spirit when Jesus breathed on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. But then they waited and then the Spirit came upon them. So again, I'm just putting that. So that was the challenge for me to wake up in the morning, go out and looking at Goliath, but realize you have absolutely nothing you can do. And having crisis and situation and knowing there's absolutely nothing you can do. You realize without him, you can't do nothing. As I went through this crisis, and it was almost five months into it, just a couple of highlights that sets it up for this sermon. The first time I ministered after that was with Bill Johnson and Randy Clark. We were doing a big, it was probably the biggest healing school we had done in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I didn't even know they knew about it. But I mean, I've come fresh out of a treatment center at least it was my leadership group and you, but they just came in. I feel, okay, you're ready. You can minister, but just we're going to watch. You're going to go low and slow before you're going in, and, and we're going to watch your calendar to make sure there are Sabbaths and time to continue your healing process, the getting well and everything else. So I had a team around me. So when I came there, I was just terrified in a sense, and, and I kind of knew how to operate in words and knowledge, the gifts of the Spirit and all of those things, but what happened in the treatment center in those five months is that all my ships got shipwrecked. And the only one that survived was on ship. So in the storms for those five months, in the dark night of the soul, and it was just darkness, severe depression, demonic attack, you were alone. And I call it my molting seasons. If you heard my eagle message, it was like you're losing your feathers, you're losing your vision, broken wings, you don't know how to soar, and you're standing down a rock in it. And I still remember, I was sometimes locked up myself in a room just with water up there, just waiting, crying out to God, but there was no answer back. And day and night and day and night, it was just, it was almost like a hell on earth when you're not able to experience his presence. But that's also when I realized that if I have his presence, I have everything. But if I have the whole world, but I don't have his presence, I have nothing. So I just, I didn't know, I didn't take enough time to be aware of his presence. So I came out there as I say, this was in May, and during May 26, in 2006, so a little bit over five months into this process, I'm in Minnesota, had arrived there, and Bill and Randy were very gracious, and I'm supposed to do five sessions. But the struggle was that, as I say, I knew how to kind of operate in the gifts and power you could do. You shared a testimony, releasing an atmosphere, creating faith, and all those things. But now you're just a son. So I couldn't operate with my apostleship because that had just sink. Or you can't operate with any other ships, leadership, or anything else. It was just a sonship. But what do you do if the father is not doing anything? If you, all you do is what you see the father do. And what do you say if the father is still? And so I just had this crisis moment on the way on the plane, and I almost like, <clears throat> I think I have a cold. I need to call Randy. I mean, I was just trying all these different, because it's very intimidating to be in this environment, and all these people have expectation. And then they show my video. I've seen over a million people yet. And all those, you get these invitations. I mean, and then in the next one, you realize there's absolutely nothing I can do. I just have to wait. I'm putting this into place because this was a key part of my story. And then I still remember I came up there, and then I heard the father just whisper, son, all you need to talk about, I don't want you to talk about any of your strength, anything that you have done, but I want you to just talk about your breakdowns. Talk about your weakness. They've, they've already said that's not, but I want you just to talk about that. So I was just very vulnerable. And I just look at what I'm doing with you. I just share my story with him. But this is not like now, 18 years later. No, I'm like, I just came out of a treatment center. <laughs> Spent 11 years on opiates. Like, are you going to pray for us? <laughs> How do we know? I mean, 86% will not make it in six months. It was not a very pleasant, I can see as you are. Right there, it's just fresh and it is raw and I'm bleeding. But then what happens was all over the place, other people that was broken, they ran up to the altar, and I still had so many stories of people who were set free from opioids and all kinds of things uh, because the vulnerability removes away shame. Yeah. Yeah. Good word. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it's also so important for us. We're not going to just talk about it, and I'm not talking about a Friday story without also having a Sunday story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I want you to know, so I'm not talking about just talking about Friday, but I, I don't want us to avoid the Friday stories. And just talk about Sunday stories. Or not talk about Saturday, that is the processes between your Friday when it seems like everything is dying and your Sunday. Because we have so many times, the tendency to just talk about our Sunday stories. 
and we want to talk about the resurrection and we need to celebrate and give people hope but we also need to give language for people when they walk through so they don't stop in the middle of the valley of shadow of death so they fear no evil because he is with them and his rod and his staff comfort them so i'm putting this into perspective but one of my highlights from that event was this in pre- and i did a little bit of what i did to release the baptism of love and a couple of things but uh, there was a group, uh, Randy came up to me and said, there's a group from Asia, Southeast Asia, and they've been sponsored by Hosanna Lutheran Church to come to this event, and they just need some comfort. Would you take some time with them? And I brought them in, and, and there was Paul and Almira, and some of you maybe already know them, some Filipinos, but it was one from Indonesia, Malaysia, and they just say, hey, we've all been ministering to Muslim world, and we have not seen any fruit. Could you just share some of your wisdom and pray for us? And so we just had a couple of hours I shared, shared some video, just shared some of my story, but from a place of brokenness. And so as I shared with them, they said, can you please pray? And I went in the room, Lord, just bless them. And it was just very gentle. And But two of them, it was like a sledgehammer that just boom, came in over them. And when they came up on the floor, oil was flowing out of their hands. So for me, that's a sign and wonder. Science that makes you wonder. And sometimes what we do is we get distracted by the sign that we don't know what we're supposed to wonder about. So in the middle of that, later on, in Hosanna Lutheran Church, and, and remember my stories, I was already fathering a group and a movement and churches and ministry and marketplace before then. But again, what I realized that what was happening is I went to Papa Jack and said, Papa Jack, I called him, I said, I, I really do not need a spiritual father. And it was like a quiet shock. But what I need is to be a spiritual son. And I just want to remove away any expectation from you, what you're supposed to do for me. But are you, I want you to know I'm coming after you. And I'm not saying that I didn't need a father, but I wanted to explain that you don't put an expectation on what somebody else is going to be towards me. It is just my responsibility. Even in my doctoral thesis, I did this whole thing of discipleship and mentorship. And I, I studied people when you had a healthy relational component to it. But the people that had the greatest transformation was not what kind of a spiritual father and mother you had, but what kind of a son and daughter you were. I, can, I have measured it now in five continents from 88 years old to 18 and all different color back and so I can prove it that this thing, this, this has come all these years later. But anyway, I didn't plan to go to, I'm going to try to not chase too much of that rabbit, but I started a journey with Papa Jack. That's why every single day I called him, wherever I was in the world. Not because I, I needed something, for, but I needed to be a son. And I needed to be a son to Papa God as my son. Heavenly Father, just like Jesus, living in such a dependency on my Father, the Father. So I was so sensitive to the Spirit because the dove was resting upon my sonship. And when I just rested in that, as soon as the apostleship, and it was still got resurrected, and our leadership and friendships and stewardships and all these other ships. But in the storms of life, soon as when I feel a little bit overwhelmed, chair two, I'm getting right back to that little boy with a big papa. And there's always rest. I find my resting place in my identity. And out of my identity, there is intimacy. Out of intimacy, there is inheritance. And out of an inheritance, there is destiny. The calling, the uniqueness, and your special sauce. So tomorrow, I'm looking forward to Pastor Jonathan. We had some time, uh, actually, with him and his wife. And he said it was one of my highlights when we were together last time. And we were just sitting out and having dinner. And And pretty much, I put maybe a a father's hat, a papa's hat, or a life coach hat, you can, but we're just sharing life. And I just use a practical principle about life and dealing with different things. What is the gainers and drainers? And what are you really required of that only you can do? From God, that you cannot hire or train or equip anybody else to do, or how to stay within your lane, and how do you burn brightly without burning out? And tomorrow afternoon, I want to spend some time, just not me preaching or teaching, just wanted to share Uh, And we're going to look, I'm going to use the David and Goliath story. Because in every shepherd boy, there is actual potential of a king. But there's so very few believers on their journey from, as I'm saying, from your starting point to be able to finish well. And somehow in the journey from David, go from Bethlehem to, he went to Adullam, he went to, I mean, he had a zigzag moment. That's when it seems like everything is dying. I mean, all, how do we navigate? Yes, there we have. Come on. This is Papa John. Yes. (laughs) 
So being where I at, I got so overwhelmed, my Papa John came in. Yeah, so, so tomorrow afternoon, so if you, if you want to be in tomorrow afternoon, but uh, he would just share the value. So because my heart and my value because of this process, I wanted to use David as an example, and then I, I wanted to help you to navigate from being a shepherd boy, shepherd girl, to go through all the seasons of life, and then eventually that you end up in Zion where you learn how to rule and reign together with him. But I'm not going to take and pray for you for going from Bethlehem to Zion. But we're going to help you through your Adullam season, how to deal with your Ziglag season, how to go from in Adullam where everybody is coming for their needs and you have your cave experience, your winter season. How do I navigate those things? Or the Saturdays that is between your Friday and Sunday. And then how do I eventually get to Zion and be faithful and ruling and reigning, creating a ceiling that becomes the floor for the next generation? Even in your life that you are thinking every decision I make, the reason I'm going actually right now to the Middle East on the next few trips is not because of me. The reason I did my doctor degree is not, I didn't need another doctor degree. The reason I did it is for the generation that I cannot see. The decision I make now is because I don't want my future grandkids to be in movie theater with suicide bombers. So, because you have one generation that pays so the next generation can play. But now Jack, that generation also have to pay so the next one cannot play. And if you have three generations, you can transform cities and nations. So the, the enemy, the devil, is actually discipling nation. And it didn't just happen. It has been the periods of time that things have been taking place. But we also have to be wise in this season. So I'm going to do that a little bit tomorrow afternoon. Take you through some of those. So, so when you're facing with a giant, and we're going to do that tomorrow afternoon. So we're going to deal if there's any giants on your inside. And you said, what do you mean by that? Meaning if you went to bed last night, it was there. You woke up this morning, it was there. Something bigger than yourself that you are experiencing. I call it a giant. And then we got to also find out what is the chief of your giants. The one thing that gives pain to everything else. The one Goliath, the chief of those giants in your life. And to be able to deal to get rid of that. Because we cannot deal with a giant on the outside as long as we have these giants on the inside. But then you're also going to learn how to deal with the giants that are on the outside in your life so that we can raise up a culture of courage, of giant slayers, not coming in from performance, but knowing who you are and whose you are. Learning to be practicing your heart so you'll be a worshiper. Say worshiper. But also to find your sling so you will be a warrior. Say warrior. Learning to develop the lamb's heart. Say lamb. But also learning the authority of the lion. Say lion. Because you only have authority over what you love. It has to come from the lamb's heart. I was trying to put the picture up on the screen earlier, but I, I, I like to look at memory stones because when I'm looking at Goliath, I am going to get back to where I was at. It was just a little bit mind map. But I looked at one of the giants I'm facing in about a month when I'm heading to. There was actually several giants that is just totally impossible. So what I took on my phone, because that's one of the prints that we're going to see tomorrow afternoon, I went back to all the memorial stones. Like this one here, the reason I had this bracelet on today, it was 30 years since my first trip to Africa. And so it, it reminds me, because when I cannot see and I cannot hear, I end up in channel number two. What I do in channel number two that is a guarantee to get me back again to chair one is to remember his faithfulness. And so I'm going back and I'm looking at one lady that came up to me, I think it was two nights ago, when I was ministering. She said, last year when you were here, I had cancer. And two weeks afterwards, the cancer was gone. And then I remember two other people running up to me, stage four cancer. And then I remember we had a season of creator miracles in America. And I hadn't seen it for a while. But I realized just recently it started to happen. And then I started to look through and hundreds and hundreds of pictures and different things. I sent some to Sammy this morning, but just, I started to get so overwhelmed. There's the bear, there's the lion, and now I'm facing Goliath. I don't see how big the giant is, but how big God is. Yeah. So it's just learning always, because biggest thing the enemy is doing, if that's financial or hell, whatever giants that you're facing, he's trying to get you to forget the faithfulness and the goodness and the kindness of God from your past. And there's moments when you cannot see. And there's moments you cannot hear. But if you can just have memory stones to constantly remind you. And sometimes it's a small little thing. But that small is a new big in the kingdom. 
Let me say that sometimes it is small little thing, but that small is the new big in the kingdom. That little thing, that was maybe the migrant headache, but that started a ripple effect to somehow to create the miracles. There was maybe that one Muslim that certainly opened up the door for all these other things that God was doing. So being aware of the small things that he's doing, because small is the new big. Anyway, so I'm back to this message. So in Paul and Almira in uh, and this healing school with Bill and Randy, Almira came up to me in the hallway and I mentioned there was 3,000 people, one of our biggest healing school. And, and Paul and Almira, they came up to me and she, he is an introvert and she is like an extrovert. And she had this, hey, could you be our spiritual father? And you remember, all my ships had gone shipwrecked. The only one that survived was sonship. So I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm thinking, I'm just trying to be a son. And then Almira grabbed hold of me like this Jacob prayer, this Filipino. And I just met him. We're not going to let go of you until you bless us. <laughs> I mean, she grabbed me. I'm like, I'm in the... So I thought, okay, let me just give him a little blessing so I could, I could leave to the room. So, so I, okay, okay, let me bless them. Come over there. And, and I started to speak a father's blessing. And it takes a father's blessing to unlock the destiny of sons and daughters. So I just blessed them. But what I didn't know, the potential of this blessing. So I blessed them with a father's blessing, unlocked the treasure chest that is in their life. And boom. In the next moment, they were on the floor. And again, oil came out of his hands. And I remember that happened when I prayed for them before. So I was just aware God is doing something. Make the next story. I'm in Seattle and I needed some financial blessing. Many things have been canceled because of my opioids. I have been in a treatment center and I told that story. And so I kind of uh, just starting back again. And I got the invitation that everybody could dream of in Christian ministry. It's like, who is whom in Christianity? And the Holy Spirit whispered, I want you to say no. So I've been praying for this one breakthrough, and here's that door that would open up everything. And they invited me. If somebody canceled, and they wanted to bring me. And the Holy Spirit whispered. But I was so sensitive to the dove and the Holy Spirit and the still small voice because I had five months without his presence. And I realized the pain of not having his presence. It's the worst feeling in the world is to be able to go and face a group of radical Muslims that wants to kill you and be alone against that giant. And have no dub. It's the most fearful thing in the world. But when his presence is there, it changes everything. So the story is, I said, no. It's like a manifest, no. <laughs> and it was all the first class ticket. We're doing this, do that. No. <laughs> Father's Day in 2006, I'm with my natural son, Leif Emmanuel, my only begotten son. And we were in Nashville together, and then I got this call. Hey! And I normally don't have my phone on when I'm with my son, but hey, Daddy Leif! And I'm like, who is this? Oh, we are your new son from the son and daughter from the Philippines. Don't you remember us? I'm like, oh, we were at Hosanna Lutheran Church, and, and you gave us the Father's blessing, and we have totally been changed, and revival has broken loose. Can you come to the Philippines? And I was about to say, no, <laughs> don't have money, don't have this, don't have trying to stay home more. And, and then I still remember the father says, Leif, you don't have time for big conferences, but you have time for family. So people don't know that part of this. So I flew across the world, sitting back on the plane, with have that broken neck, broken back, body cast, and, and all this pain. I'm sitting back on the plane and coming into the Philippines. And then I met with two Filipinos. I've been Invited to speak at a larger church in the Philippines also, but no, I want to hang out with two people because they are family. And they shared it with somebody else, and eventually it was 400 people that eventually came in the end of all of this, of their young leaders that all were orphans in the spirit. Poor, broken, there was two old motorcycles, one old car, and the rest, they had nothing. And then uh, it took me back to, I asked Papa Jack in 2000, I said, Papa Jack, what does the kingdom look like? After spending seven hours when we were talking about the kingdom, but my brain was gone. I said, son, I do not know. But all I know, it will only be entrusted to a family. And I didn't know that this little Norwegian in the soil, that because the old dream dreams, the young see visions. Fathers and mother dreams, sons and daughters have vision. So I didn't know there was a seed that went into my little Norwegian soil and started this, but what does family look like? So now I'm on my way to the Philippines, 400 Filipino, and we speak.
spent this time, and I just poured a love in, and we were doing life together. And a year afterwards, I came in there, and suddenly everything had changed. They had been from a natural family. I think we have over 5,000 years. We have not had one divorce. And that's 18 years. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying that that became my place to be able to take a seat. And 2016, Papa Jack and Frida was with me. I had a thousand of our leaders in this place, and the glory was in there. And I looked over Papa Jack, and his face, he was just weeping and weeping. And suddenly he looked over towards me and said, son, this is what the kingdom looks like. So it was 16 years from a seed, our family came in. And then suddenly he saw, this is a tree full of fruit, our family. Now it's about to become a forest of family. And then we became students. That's what my doctoral thesis was, take the story of how did that happen and going through and study all the different elements, not for any other reason than how do we steward so that we can continue to multiply so we can get authority. So this started a journey, but what I didn't know that this Filipino day was such a son and daughter to me. I didn't know how to be a son in that way to Papa Jack. So people are known for the one that was such a son because every day for 22 years we did vacations together, we did everything together, we had New Year together, I and mean, we became one. And so we did this life together for 22 years. So what was actually happening there with, uh, and even I was with Papa Jack, and I sat with him when he died, and I had just come home from Pakistan. I'm sitting at the hospital and I was heartbroken. I was tired, beaten, had just been at the battlefield and Frida called me, my wife called me. I went down to Melbourne, sat at the hospital and he was out. So they just had the machines on and he was not going to make it. And I tried, I cried and cried and I actually took my phone, just memory stone, had hoped because twice before we've seen him coming back again from things that had attacked. So at this moment, the doctor says, there is nothing, we're about to take him in and, and we're taking off all the equipment and everything else and I had to leave and it was during the COVID season so you had to be outside the hotel, couldn't even be inside. Then Frida went up and later on Tim and his, wife, and his son and daughter Tammy came in and, and then in the afternoon they said, you have one more chance to just say goodbye before we are taking him. And so I went up to the room and I just tapped him and said, Papa Jack, Papa Jack, and I, said, I love you so much. I said goodbye and I kissed on him and I hold him. And suddenly he came up, and it's an impossible. He came up and I got it on the phone. He looked at me and said, son, welcome back. I have been praying for you. And I just wept and I wept and I wept because I got my phone, got the last part of it. I got, Papa, I thought he's coming back now. What is your favorite message? Moses and the rod, son, lay it down. And it was a story of, what do you have in your hand? I got a rod, lay it down, lay it down, lay it down. And let your rod be laid down so you can pick up his rod. Because it has a hiss in it if it doesn't become his. And I gave you a rod, Pastor Jonathan, in honor of that. And that started the journey. I mean, I'm putting this together and now I'm going to transition into the message coming but the Filipino was such a son and daughter to me I could call them up and say hey what's going on with me and Paul could say hey you have pain in your neck he could feel what was going on and I thought it was unusual but I had learned through covenant relationship with my wife and I'd be one that while I am in Pakistan I could feel something going on with my wife uh, not knowing what it was but uh, because of the oneness that started to take place and it's the only time I've seen two times where everybody got healed in a meeting. One time with over a thousand people in a meeting. Everybody, but nobody praying. It's just that the body is becoming so healthy. There's such a love that ha takes place because perfect love unites. Fear divides. And even cancer cells cannot operate where the total unity has happened. Because they divide cells. And, and it's just a sovereignty. But I think sometimes God gives you a taste of something sovereignly speaking so that you can in the next moment say, God, if that's possible. Not copying it, I cannot copy it, but what I can is getting hunger and thirst that could it be that as I'm saying that Jesus only unanswered prayer, that we are going to be one like him and the Father is one. The loving experience with the Father is going to be in us, the glory experiencing, and eventually that, that's how the world is going to see. That's how the world will believe, three different times in those passages. So anyways, I've been on this journey, Paul and Amir became such a son and daughter to me, they are the one that taught me to be a son. And it's the best investment I've ever done. I would never made that investment to say no to first class ticket and all the money and all the support and all of that. And there's been three other times since that these invitations, but God took me through and said, no, I want you just to go with the poor and 
and still doing it, going over there. And then I took him with me to Pakistan, then took him with me to Africa, started to bring them with me around a different world. And the greatest miracle I saw was not when I preached or when I, when I shared. I was up, up to release a healing. One more testimony. It is Paul, he's usually with me because he knows how to soak uh, John. And you know, actually, Pastor Paul, Filipino. And so Paul himself, he was there just, he soaked and he goes into press. And I'm not always that good at it, but he helps me to be a lamb. I know how to be a lion, but he, he teaches me. Daddy, come, let's just go and be with a lamb. So he gets so overwhelmed by the lamb and the identity is rooted in the lamb. So the authority is in the lion. And when you roar, people will gather instead of scatter because now it comes from the lamb's heart. So we are there on the floor and we had just had all these killings going on and suicide bombers and it was chaos everywhere. And we were in the room and he just brings me into this place. Let's lay down on the floor. So I'd like to see the movie in heaven. We see a little Philippine and Norwegian laying on the floor for three hours, holding around each other. And the glory came in. <laughs> Until we get so overwhelmed by him that nothing else can overwhelm us. That you find such a rest, you can speak to the storm that is around because you no longer have a storm on the inside. We can talk to Jesus about that. So we are in this process of when we go into the stage, it's the biggest meeting also we had, and, and he is there to intercede in behalf of me. And I just felt that in a few moments I have this, I had to use the right language. This adopted son from the Philippines, he is with me. He is going to come and he's going to release fire over you. There's over 80,000 people. And this huge stadium. And when he does that, all the cancer is going to disappear. You people in the wheelchair, you're going to stand up. You're going to watch what's going to happen. It just comes out of me. Like, what did I just say? And then I'm looking at him. He, he's a quiet intercessor. And so finally I just, okay, come up. And he goes up to the microphone and is quiet. And he's normally very more quiet, introvert, and very soft. And suddenly he comes up. And the, fire, the lion of the tribe of Judah roared over that stadium and all over the place. And we had over 30,000 healings and 300 creative miracles that happened. And that's when I learned the lesson. Uh, and then afterwards, interview with him. And, and they said, hey, were you not nervous? And Paul Yada said, oh, no, because there's no failure where there is a father. If my father believed that that was going to happen, I don't need to be nervous because I cannot fail. It's not if you walk on water or not. It matters that your father was well pleased with you, trusted and believed you before you did anything. And I don't have to prove or have the approval of anything. I have the approval of Father God, but also I have a spiritual father. And when he said that they want to interview, that's when I caught that phrase. There's no failure where there is a father. So that started our journey. But I'm putting this all together that we have been on a journey as we've started to see. We, we've been a very encounter-driven, and I still believe in encounter. But we're getting back to the basics together. That movement, our movement in Cuba, I'm going to tell one testimony, and then we're going to be, are you guys okay? So I'm going to put a little bit good theology to this. But we feel we're moving into harvest season. The framework, what I've done, the first night, I'm focusing on receiving love. And actually, it's kind of the great command, and love the Lord your God. But you cannot love him until you know first how much he loves you. I can only return what he first came from him. I cannot give something I didn't receive. He, last night, we're focusing a little bit on you, loving you the way that he loves you. Today, we're going to do from chair one now, how do we bring this love to a world out there? Not from a performance, but now in the sense when you become love. So even in my doctor degree, I studied the up in and then the out. I study what I call a, a, a pneumatological mission or vacation that comes out of this. So the transformation, what I did research on people that have had love encounters compared to that didn't. And healthy spiritual family parenting, meaning a discipleship multiplication with a healthy uh, relational component. I defined it. And then I saw what is the transformation when it comes to spiritual transformation, holistic identity formation, and pneumatological mission on vacation. I'm going to try to be simple, meaning just a spirit-empowered way you live and love like Jesus that is changing the world around you as a result of that. Is there any difference? And I looked at the historical context, Old Testament, New Testament, etc., etc., etc. So back to the basic. That is giving me PT as the post-traumatic school disorder. I don't want my head to be bigger than my heart in this season. So 
Anyway, back to the basics. So we have just started this. Can we get back to some of the spiritual practices? Get back to the basic, to just be with Jesus, simply to be with Jesus. That the best thing about Jesus is Jesus. What does this look like? And then how do we become like him? That's just becoming like him. Not something we are trying anything, but what we are beholding is what we're becoming. So that's what we release. And so we started this because, as I mentioned, that there is this two orphan world where you have to, as I say, you have to believe, and then you have to behave, and then you get belonging. But the Chernobyl one culture is actually a little bit different because he first invites you to belong. And then when you start to be with him, you start to believe. And then your behavior change. I just want you to see the different way of kingdom family, the operating system of the kingdom. So today I want to focus more. So we focus a little bit on the up the first night, in, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the out. And I felt that God started to speak to us at his harvest time. And I know that yesterday, John, Arnold, we talked about it, and he just asked me some question about the harvest. And I was not even aware it was that. I knew it was ripe. And the harvest is so ripe right now that we've never seen it before. So if you can from chair number one, open up your eyes and see and look and see the harvest, you're going to put your damn shoes on. And I know that uh, John, I think, is going to share some of the things that God is doing. It's so important in this season, three questions to answer. Say, what time is it? And I didn't mean chronos. I mean, what is the kairos moment we're living in right now? And I'm here to propose that we are the generation, the only generation for 2,000 years, the second most important generation in world's history. The first one was when Jesus showed up. But this is the second most important generation that have ever lived. And we're the only generation that have had an opportunity to finish the unfinished task, to get the gospel to every person and the church among every people group. And this gospel, Matthew 24, 14, of the kingdom, not just salvation, it's part of it, but of the kingdom must be preached as a testimony or witness to all ethnos, all nations, and then the end will come. And it started with a question where they say, well, what is going to be the sign, singular, of the coming of the Son of Man? What is the one thing we need to look for? It didn't say the signs, but Jesus answered a singular question with a plural answer, and he talked about all the signs. And we get distracted with all the signs. But he said, no, 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 no. The end has not yet to come. But this gospel, verse 24, 14. Excuse me, chapter 24, verse 14. So we started last year and just getting overwhelmed by Jesus and decided from chair one, let's look at the harvest in Canada. Let's look at the harvest in America. Let's see how rough it is. But then we realize we need to get back to the basic with Jesus. So on the screen, screen today, we're going to actually have a little teaching and you're going to get some good notes. Are you guys okay? I'm going to be able to do this in about 10, 12 minutes. But these, how much time do we have, Johnny? Can we go to about 12, 15? But from John chapter 4, this is the story about the Good Samaritans. How many of you have been familiar with my three chairs? As you've been here for some of them. How many of you are rooted and grounded in love? Hey. Uh, I'm asking, how many of you are rooted and grounded in love? How many of you experienced the depth, width, length, and the height of that love? How many of you believe there would be an upgrade if just Jesus wanted to borrow your body and, and live his life through you for a week? That the people around you will maybe notice there's a little difference. Actually, that is normal Christian life. A life... In the spirit, a life of abiding, a life of chair number one. It's to be with him, to become like him, and simply do what Jesus does. And he always reflect the Father. All I do is what I see my Father do. I say what my Father says. And again, my challenge has been the last for two nights is I want everyone to know how good Papa God is. And I want everyone to know how loved they are. And for that to happen, everyone in Canada, I want to know. I want them to know. I want them to experience how good Papa God is. And I want them to know how loved they are. I want every Canadian to have an encounter with God just like Jesus. That's my experience. This is every Muslim, every Hindu, every Buddhist, every Sikh. Because Jesus is perfect theology. It's the only way that I can. So I'm going in and this started to stretch me. So let's start here on the screen. I think we have, it says come and drink. I will just highlight the taking out if you follow me for a few moments. But it starts in verse 4. John 4 verse 4. I'm just going to take a few verses and then we're going to release something. 
But he needed, say he needed, to go through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Let me just stop for a few moments. I wish we had time, theologically speaking, to see the significance of this. Because if you remember when Joseph blessed his sons, one got a double, but the other one, hey, you are the Samaritans. It's almost like an Ishmael Isaac equation. Hey, I made a covenant with you, but you also have a blessing. And including with a Jacob, the two things he longed for more than anything else in his life. He says, it's not a Calvinism statement only, but he, said, he talked about Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. And a lot of times we are looking at it, but pretty much what he's saying, Esau, you received the birthright and the blessing, but you didn't value it. But Jacob on the other side, he had some issues. But he's willing to do anything to be able to get hold of the birthright and his blessing. He did it in the wrong way. And so there's also, yes, there's a connection to the sovereignty of God in this, but there is also a connection of Jacob. But the interesting thing with Jacob in this, because this is the well, so it goes back to that. So the Samaritans, there's a root issues that came out of that vision that took place that had to do with when Joseph blessed one of them, got blessed, and the other one felt like, I'm a second-class citizen. So look, at, and there's so many things I could talk about the Samaritans, but I want you to know how many of you remember the story about the good Samaritan? It's like me saying, well, uh, I, I was just in America, and there I met that good Canadian. <laughs> what does that say about all of the rest of the Canadians? I, I don't know if you get I me. Mean, so even the story about the good Samaritan, it is actually a shocking value that somebody could be good and a good Samaritan. And that's what Jesus is doing in that story. Why choosing a Samaritan? That's a miracle in itself, understanding the biblical context. So this is a sore story that Jesus, he needed, he needed. There was this, why did Jesus need to go to Samaria? If I was Jesus, chair number two. If I were Jesus, I would go through. That's what people did. You're going around it. You don't want to go into the project. You don't want to go into the Muslim. I don't want to be around the Shia. They, and I could just go on and on. Those people, it is this us against them. That is the very group of people that you're going around. You don't go right in the middle of it. All we're going to learn is to chant about one way of Jesus today. And the thing that is not Jesus, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to help us to move it away. Because the world is looking for a God that looks like Jesus. So the story here is that Jesus, and, and I have a little... This is my theology. There's a lot of things the scholars can say as I'm studying this one verse. But why did he need to go through? I think there's an element because the father is going through. Because all he did was he see the father. So the father's like, hey, I'm going to take you right in the middle of Samaritans. Right in the middle of those people that hate you. And you actually, at least in the Jewish culture, have a hatred towards them. Trump or Biden? I'm a Norwegian. I can play Swiss. <laughs> what do you believe about this? And what do you believe about that? Hey, what do you know about this Israeli and the Palestinian? What do you believe? Blah, 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 blah. Well, I cannot answer that question. It is outside my area of anointing. And my anointing rests upon my assignment. And my assignment is connected to my alignment. What I'm doing it is it's called wisdom. That I'm called to touch the Shias and the Sunnis. I'm touched to touch the Jews and the Samaritans. My calling is so. In the next moment, I'm not going to create a us against them. I'm not going to operate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and choose who is good and who is evil. I choose the tree of life. And I'm going to abide in the tree of life. So Jesus had to go into Samaria. And Jesus is heading right into what seems like the enemy's camp. I don't know who that is in Canada for you. But I have made a long list of who that in chair number two would be. And then when they're coming in there, Jesus chooses to go to a well. Say well. By interest in Jesus, why didn't you go to a synagogue? Or why didn't you find a, find a home or find something else? I mean, why would you choose a well? And I can explain that one. Because everybody needs a well. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or if you are a Samaritan. It doesn't matter if you are poor or if you are rich. It, didn't, it doesn't matter if you're a police officer or if you are a criminal. It doesn't matter which political party you belong to. Everybody needs water. So Jesus is finding the unifying factor of what everybody in society needs. It doesn't matter who they are. That's the place I'm going to meet you. At your place of thirst. 
So when Jesus shows up, I'm just giving you a couple of highlights there. He shows up at the well. Say well. And when he chooses this place that is a unifying place of what some, everybody needs, your body is 70% water and is looking and longing for water. Let me give you a chain of one statement. You're made of spirit. And guess what you are thirsty for? And what is Jesus looking for? Worship it and we worship the Father in spirit and in I don't know if you get it. That's chair number one. So Jesus is going to get to that. But there's something else with Jesus that surprises me when Jesus shows up there. Well, he is a Jew. They are Samaritan. She is a woman. You need to understand in the Middle Eastern culture, and one of the things that I wish as a Norwegian or American or Canadian, that we can understand the scripture and not misreading scripture with individualistic eyes. Because... I, I want you to understand that's the tendency we have and we're looking at the scriptures and we see it from chair number two. But it is a collective culture. It is a family culture. It is an honor and shame society. And we're looking at a guilt. You're guilty. And I want you to know a gospel that doesn't also provide, it is not just dealing with people's guilt or sin issue. That's important. It's one third of the gospel. But you also have to deal with shame and fear. Because all those three things was lost in the garden, and Jesus came to deal with all three things. Yeah. And in the Muslim world, it is honor and shame. It's not so much, we're going to get your forgiveness for your sins so you can get to heaven and get righteous. That is not the biggest issue. Even what's happening now with the Hamas, uh, I want people to understand that one of the issues there is with the Jewish situation there is like, hey, you did this wrong, so we're going to punish you. But a Muslim, that's not the issue. The issue is you dishonored us, and now we're going to punish you. There's different languages. And for us as a kingdom people from Chen by one, we are coming with a gospel that helps people to are free from both shame, fear, and guilt. And not get them to join just an orphanage, but to actually find family. So when you say the one billion soul harvest, uh, I was speaking at the voice of the apostle. And Raina Bunk, it was the last time I saw him was a speaker before me. And, and I remember I went to my room and I was a little overwhelmed. And and I was and I could not sleep that night. And I was going to finish the session. We were in Nashville. But during that session, I just felt this. And I didn't know what it was. And then I felt, look up to one billion soul and the prophecy. And I looked at the Bob Jones. And I looked at some things that Paul Kane had said on other one. I just kind of sat on the internet. I'd never done that before. Looked at some research. In the middle of the night, my wife was snoring and sleeping. And I was sneaking there with my iPad because I couldn't sleep. And then I heard it as clearly as we're talking, it was an inner voice where the father says, Leif, do you know why the harvest has not come in yet? Because I don't want a billion orphans. I want a billion sons and daughters. Wow. And when my people are looking for the fire, I've been looking for healthy fireplaces. Yeah. And I just felt that that night, I just started to weep because I saw the father, he wants his family back. And he doesn't want us to be there as often. That's why Jesus says in John 14, 18, I will not leave you as often, I come to you. That's actually a cry from the Father. And even on the cross where he became an orphan so that we could be sons and daughters. When he says, Ali, 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 Lama, Sabbath, and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here they are, and Jesus showing up there at the well with his woman. And as he is building a bridge over to this woman, she is like, who are you? I'm a woman, you are a man. I mean, you don't do that in a Middle Eastern culture. I mean, this is an honor killing. I have spent a lot of time in a Muslim world. To meet with a woman in a Muslim world is already a death sentence for me. Unless that there is covenant or family. So people say, how do you get to meet with these Muslim women? Because they see me as family. That's why I'm the best man in Imam's weddings. Because Joseph became a father to Pharaoh and he saved the nation. How did that happen? He learned how to be such a son to Pharaoh. Jesus was such a son to his father that he became an everlasting father, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace, Shalom. Anyway, so the story is back here. So this tension is going on. Here you have a Jewish rabbi showing up with a nobody. It is somebody you don't want to be around. It's somebody you don't want to be seen with. And this is an incredible crisis situation. There's this tension going on. And then Jesus says something. Hey, could you give me something to drink? God asking a Samaritan and a woman for a favor? 
And if I were Jesus that knows everything about everything in this situation and know the Father's assignment, if I was Jesus from chair number two, you're going to go in there and you're going to deal with this, this issue because this woman has some issue. That's how I read it with individualistic eyes in chair two because you're reading the scriptures because you don't see it the way it is. You see it the way you are. And you think you have 2020 vision until you get to see him and you get to see yourself. And then you look at the story and the whole contextualization flows. So when Jesus is looking at this, he says, could you, could you give me something to drink? This is a shot you're asking a sinner for favor. While the chair two is, you have had five husbands and you're living with this guy right now and you have some issues and I'm coming here to deal with your issue so that you can get saved and eventually get to heaven. Because you don't want to die in your sin. The Father has an assignment for you. Instead, Jesus comes and says, hey, you have something that I need. I thirst. I thirst for something that you have. The chair number one way, this, I have never met a homeless person. And this is, I've never met a person broken or a billionaire or anybody else. What I do is I position myself and see they have something to teach me. There's something, and that's what honor is what love looks like. And what Jesus is actually honoring this woman knowing about all the issues before. Because he's giving her the belonging before the believing and behaving. That's always the why of Jesus. He's bringing these 12 guys in before they are born again. Yeah. Connect. And we have somehow lost the connection with the world. The Samaritans, we've often had the us against them instead of coming and realizing there's something I can learn from them. There's something I want to connect from the alcoholic to the drug addict to the billionaire to the Shia Muslim, the Sunnah Muslim. And I'm coming in to connect. You have something that I need. Can we have a conversation over it? I thirst. I thirst for something that you have. What is it that Jesus is actually thirsting for? For her to become a worshiper in spirit and in truth. Because that's the Father's assignment. You see that later on in the passage. That's actually his thirst. I just want you to come home. I don't want you to be there. I thirst. You have something I don't need. There's something in you, and that's called worship that you have not discovered yet. And I have something eventually I'm going to give you. But before that, you have something that I need. So say when we say well, well. say water. water. So it's this conversation on water, and she comes in, and hey, don't, don't you help me? Why didn't you bring your own bucket? And are you flirting with me? I mean, it's... We can read between the story. Look on YouTube. There's a seven-minute clip there on, from the Chosen on that story. And I weep every time I see it. It's just one of these little seven minutes from Chosen on, the woman at the well. But it kind of gives you a visual effect of a little bit what took place. So when, uh, when the woman is there and the conversation starts to go back, and then finally Jesus is like, well, if you knew who I was, you would have asked me for water. And she is like, like who is this guy? And he said, well, well, give me this water because you will never thirst again if you get it. But, but, but who is this guy? And humility comes in. I, I, I will, well, give me that then. If I'm going to not having to come here day by day because I feel she's not the only one. Everyone in chair number three, everyone in chair number two, they are thirsty for something. But what they're doing similar like this woman, they go to a well and they temporarily come with a bucket and they're meeting their temporary satisfaction again and again. But they never deal with a root issue of their life including most of us in church. We're coming from one event, one conference. Can you give me some water? And then you go back again, and we're dehydrated, and we need some more water. And we will continue to drink, 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 but it doesn't touch the deepest root issue in our life until we come to Jesus and let him give us a different water. And when you start to thirst for that, river starts to flow, and wherever the river goes, there is life, there is healing, there is freedom. Yeah. Those who are thirsty, come and drink. So say it with me. Say, well, yeah. say water. So Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So say it with me. Say, well. well. Say, water. water. The next thing what Jesus does now, hey, why don't you bring your husband? Now, whew, now you can come in with a word. What we wanted to do is come with a word first. Chair two, evangelism. I got these spiritual laws. Five spiritual laws. Hey, I have a word for you. Instead of first connecting with people, first finding out what are they thirsty for, 
knowing that you have something here that you're going to give. So this is now coming in. It starts with a well that you find in a unifying place. Then you start to have the conversation about water because there's something in every single person that is looking and longing for this, but they just don't know they're just drinking from religion or they're drinking from medication. Whatever they're doing, trying to medicate something. But oh, you don't have to come to that level. us thirst no more so that's the conversation of water and that is the word it gives a word of knowledge as a so she comes with a conversation hey and here's what i love about her she's authentic she's real and this is also don't don't start with shame or fear or anything else when jesus comes in and gives you a word you have something else for it because what the truth demands grace always provides don't speak truth without grace it is mean but don't give them grace without truth because it is meaningless. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Because if I'm going to tell you that, I mean, I may be coming in and say you have cancer, I feel sorry for it, but if I don't also give you the cure for that cancer, the truth, the truth will set you free. But if you give grace and truth together, it is medicine and healing. So you speak the truth in love. That means if I speak, it is wrapped in love. In the bottle, if I give you the bottle, the bottle is love. And in it, there is truth to set people free. So Jesus in this circumstance and this story, and I just love this story. This is where I'm at. Are you guys okay? A little, because I feel this is supposed to be a well, and all over Canada there is well. Toronto was a well. We came from all over to taste something different. And I'm thirsty again. You're going to see this now in the end. I'm about to land this because this is a lot of stuff that I have here. It's 36 slides if I go through the whole thing, but... And now you're going into word. And then she said, you are right. And he said, it's not just that, by the way. You've had five husbands, and the one that you now live with is not your husband. And but she acknowledges when the word comes in and what she is authentic and real. And let's have a conversation about there's some issue here. But I want you to know from chair two, you will say, this woman is a sinner. That's what you would think. But let me give you the same scripture from Middle East. A woman couldn't divorce herself from her husband. So this woman is somebody that believes in covenant, believes in marriage, and she meets this guy that comes in, and perhaps she cannot get pregnant right away, or perhaps it needs to be a very small little reason, and he just suddenly divorces her, and here she is left. Believed in love, believed in covenant, she is broken, and she is out there bleeding. And so somebody else comes along and is going to give her a promise. It happens again, and this happened a third time, the fourth time. This woman is so broken. Every time she has trusted and love, everything she has been drink from something, she gets more sick. And now suddenly she doesn't even have because it is more provision and protection to have a husband in a culture context. But now she has nobody. And this guy comes and let her live with her just as so she has a roof over her head and the basic. And every day she's just driving. Do you see it changes the story? Because everybody has a story out there. And the lens is how we see it, that you do not see it based upon their history, but their destiny. Amen. When you see the terrorist saw, you have to see the Apostle Paul before you become it. Yeah. That's the chain of one eyes of love. So when you see the terrorist there, can you see love is patient, love is kind? The one that writes it. That's how he sees us. Why we were yet sinners, why we are in a mess, why we are... In the drug other life happened, he saw an ambassador of love to the nations. And it was the land that was slain before the foundation of the world, provided for everything. So this conversation is going on, and she comes in, and you're right. You're right about all of that. And this leads to, we know this story, are you a prophet? And this whole thing goes into the next thing that she gets so overwhelmed. But it was no conviction, I mean, it was not a condemnation, it was an invitation. It was conviction that happens because he's coming in. He's going to deal with the pain in her life. And he wants to deal with the pain in our life. But we tried to cover her up, but she didn't cover up. She opened up because what this guy is coming, he's coming with something. She didn't know exactly what it is. And the world around her doesn't know what we have until we get into chair number one. And we start to drink from this ourselves. And then the river starts to flow from our life. And when people get in contact, it doesn't matter if they're Muslim or Hindu or Sikh or if that's the billion or they're longing for something. And they're all thirsty. Because they're made of water, and they are longing for what they are made of. And they're made out of spirit. 
and what sin had made him fall short of glory. And now what Jesus wants to restore them back again to glory. Don't deal with sin management in chair two when you can deal with glory management in chair one. And if you go from glory to glory, the starting point has to be glory, not sin. And when that happens, you can see glory in people even before they become it. And even the prophetic is to call out the glory in people. That doesn't mean we don't deal with the sin issue, but let the goodness and kindness of God lead to repentance. Anyway, it's just, this is maybe my journey, and then here's the landing point. So from that place, from the word that comes in, and there's something else that happened is worship. Wow. Then it, wow. He told me everything. She, he told me everything. Everything about me. Because the truth set you free. But it was grace in there. And she goes in there, and the last thing is witness. Now she's becoming contagious. And by Acts 8, when the revival broke loose in Samaria, it was connected to this woman. She became the seed of the revival. She was a premature. That later on became a tree that became a force that swept among the Samaritans. And I just feel it is a word for us right now. And I'm landing this with these two pictures in the end. Uh, there's this place in Chile. On Tuesday, I'm flying to Chile. So I'm home for one day. So pray for grace. Oh, you guys, okay. Give me a big Canadian smile that you have the grace for five more minutes for lunch. Let's look at this night. So there's this desert. It's called the Atacamba Desert in Chile. Can we see if we can get that picture up? It is the driest place in the world, in the earth. You can look it up on internet. That's where we found it. The driest place on the earth. So when you look at it, this maybe looks a little bit like some people see Canada from chair two. If you don't look, maybe it looks like a lot of dry season right now. And it looks maybe you have dryness in your life. Or there's maybe dryness in your finances. Or dryness in all the promises on healing. And I don't know what wilderness or dryness you have in your life. But there is something that is actually taking place in the dryness. This picture is taken. It's been seven years of no rain. But I want you to see the next picture that is coming up. In the same area here. This is what I call a super bloom uh, harvest. Because underneath, because what is happening is there's a dry season. COVID was part of that, and there's a connection in the spirit. For, but underneath the ground, there are seeds that has been broken in the middle of it. And in your soil, over your family, over your finances, over your health, you have to see from China, but when underneath the ground, there are seeds underneath. And it's been maybe a long season, a long wilderness, a long dryness, but underneath, it's just been these things that's been just been waiting. And the greatest harvest we have ever about to see is about to take place. And it's called a super bloom harvest. Because when the rain comes in, there's a season change. The seeds are there, and then the season change. And you're right in that season change right now. There's about nine months pregnant, and the water is about to break. And some of you feel the discomfort that wants to abort the very thing that's taking place because you don't understand. And if you don't understand, you don't know how to value. And if you don't know how to value to carry that baby, you don't know how to steward it and carry it. Then you don't know how to birth it. And then how to raise it. That's what John and Carol did so beautiful. It was not just birthing something. But it was such a father and mother to raise it up. And I know my life will never be the same. And now I have the same honor of honoring fathers and mothers in 22 countries. I felt I needed to share one more testimony that just I love with this. It's, uh, uh, I went to Cuba first. I've been to Cuba 46 times, and we have a, we have a move of God's Spirit in Cuba. We have actually an incredible Chernobyl One movement. And it started actually, I've been going there for, this is for 24 years. But when I was first in Cuba, it was kind of a dry season, and one of the top evangelists, chair two, was this us against them, communism is bad, and we are the good, and they are persecuting us. And, but then he had a baptism of love outside Hotel Nacional, and he got changed, and he became a lover. And then he was starting to learn the kingdom way of operating and started to release some favor, because even when the communist was coming to persecute him, he's like, wow, these terrorist Saul is about to become Apostle Pauls. They don't know it yet. So he did, because, again, he changed his lenses because the way he saw God and saw himself, now he was in the world a little bit different. But anyway, so this story there is like, so you guys here, we have this incredible fan. So every year or many times a year, I will be there in December again with a the team. So anyway, so we came there and 
And Yaki, the pastor's wife, they're the lead couples, Yazir and Yaki. Aki came to me, and they came from an assembly of God background. And they've been my spiritual son and daughter for years, and incredible fathers and mother of this movement. So in this setting, Aki came to me and said, when I go and get my hair cut, I have this sweet sister in our church that cut my hair. She actually looks a little bit like you, so I just have, to <laughs> have that same hair and everything else. So Aki okay, said, so I have this, and she has this beautiful black hair, and she said, but I, I kind of didn't like my hair that much. And I'm like, where is she going with this? And she said, but there is this other lady that's not far away in Havana, but when she cut the hair of people, it is so beautiful. And all the women, they go, did it look so beautiful? And I asked her, where do you get the hair cut? Uh, so what should I do? Should I support my sister in my church, meaning one of the church members? who cuts hair, but that's not her anointing, maybe. <laughs> or do we should go to somebody else? And so, okay, like, what is the... Yeah, I, said, I was thinking, what is the problem, I'm thinking? What is the problem with it? And then she said, the problem is she is a witch. And she's the leader of Santeria, witchcraft. So in that area, and all over her place, is all these demonic symbol and witchcraft symbol and everything else. And I, I don't remember this conversation at all, so I want you to know because... We have so many conversations. So, so, I, so Aki said, uh, so what should I do? And I had said, repent. And she had looked at me strange. I, I said, three years later is when I found out about this. So I said, repent. And she said, like, what do you mean? Meaning change the way you think. I said, well, is the love in you greater than the fear you have for the witch? And she had looked at me strange. Or oh, I said in another way, uh, do you believe, say, I mean, if the witch touches you, you can get witchcraft. Or if the witch touches you, she can be healed and set free. <laughs> if you're not sure about that, stay in channel number two. I don't remember this conversation, but I talked about this story. 2001, during COVID, we went to help. There was a lot of hardship for Cubans, still is. So we went back again and had some rounds, and I did one of the renewal revival meetings, and the river came, and whew, God showed up, and we were releasing a baptism of love, but before it was a salvation invitation, and that day there were six people, Cubans, that came up to give their life to Jesus, and then I just prayed with them, and the power of God was hitting. They got baptized in the Holy Spirit, baptized in love, immersed in the Father's love, and we just poured into them. And one of the people I didn't know, it was the witch. So later on, this is how I found out the story. So this one person who came up. So Aki had gone and got her hair cut six different times over the year and just connected like this woman. She learned the Jesus way. You have something I don't have. And she started to borrow from the witch and learn from her. That build a relationship. And she started to talk about some of the issues, build a word into the witch that eventually now led to. So the story is another year after the salvation. I didn't even know that story. So a year later, I'm coming back. That's when I found out the testimony. I'm coming into our church, similar kind of like this. It's crammed full, people outside, up on the roof. There's people everywhere. And this extravagant worship leader. And I hadn't seen her before, but they are extravagant in praise and worship in Cuba. And, uh, so we're right there in the middle of Havana, and the full worship is going on. There's an explosion of glory and worship. And I started to weep, and I was like, this worship leader, I've never seen anything like it. And they are like, so I, I said afterwards, tell me about this new worship leader. Because I've been coming here for years, but I've never seen her before. And she said, oh, that's the witch. <laughs> I said, which witch? <laughs> that started our conversation. And the story is, and then they told me the testimony and the journey. And, but also, she's not witch any longer. Her name is Lee. And she's Pastor Lee. That's just two years into it. She's leading 16 house churches right now. And she's our greatest leader, and she's the top evangelist that we have in all of Havana and probably in all of Cuba. And this is like this woman. She is my pitch of John 4 story. Let's stand to our feet. Well, water, word, worship, witness, sharing, contagious. Jesus virus <laughs> spreading. <laughs> Father, just, just let's hold out our hands and we're just going to bless us this morning that the ones that is thirsty, the ones that is thirsty, if there's dryness in your life, hopefully tomorrow, and I know tonight, as even this afternoon, I know John is going to take us and we're going to have fresh impartation. I know what they're carrying there from Toronto. It's the beautiful river and there's a new river a greater river than we've ever seen that is going to come from the well. 
So if you are dry, you're qualified. He says, come, you who are thirsty and drink. There's dryness, financially, personal. No condemnation, just an invitation. He's going to find the very thing and he's building bridges over the unifying place. And then he's going to have a conversation because you have something that he needs. And what is that? Your sonship and your daughtership for you to come home so that you can be a worshiper of the Father. <laughs> That's what he thirsts for. The thing he wants everyone to know how good his Father is and how loved they are. And he wants everyone to experience a family for them to come home. Anyone that is thirsty, he wants them to taste of this so that rivers can start to flow.